All right. Well, hello, everyone. Good afternoon and welcome. We are incredibly excited to have you here with us today for uh, Relationships First and Always. So this is basically a workshop, or not basically, it is a workshop on building new perspectives on creating relationships with our Indigenous communities with the ultimate goal of co-creation and service. Um, my name is Jessica Swan, and I am part of the NASA Scope project. NASA Scope is, in fact, sponsoring and hosting this amazing webinar opportunity. And featured with us today are both Kat Gardner Vandy and Dan Daniela Scalise. Um, go ahead and hit the next slide for us. Take a quick opportunity to talk just a little bit about well, what is this NASA Scope thing that you talk about? So NASA Scope is a uh, SMD, NASA SMD funded project. It is ultimately our goal to make connections with subject matter experts, so scientists, engineers in the field of NASA science, and make connections with them um, with NASA science activation groups. NASA science activation is charged with um, communication and educational outreach opportunities. We reach learners of all ages, and it is our goal to be able to connect subject matter experts with these groups so that we can share your science with all of these learners. Uh, we are what's called a community of practice, and as part of our community of practice, we focus primarily on best practices. So we develop and disseminate these best practices, guidelines, and strategies. So what you see today falls underneath this best practice, a strategy on how to build relationships with the communities that you wish to work with. Um, our particular domain is for the earth and space sciences. Um, and we are, our goal is to broaden participation and engage learners of all ages. And our ultimate practice you'll see there I've highlighted in green, green is to be inclusive of all audiences. Next slide, please. And so this community of practice focuses on four primary goals. So we host a variety of conferences or we participate in a variety of conferences to connect with many subject matter experts. So many of the subject matter experts that are here on the line with us, hello. We've probably seen you at one of the conferences and talked with you at one of our booths. Um, we offer communications trainings and workshops. So we have something coming up at the AGU and at GSA that fall under this category. We offer virtual trainings, voila, here we are, uh, to connect our communities together. And then we also have an opportunity for seed grants. So this is a great opportunity for our subject matter experts to connect directly with these science activation teams. And Kat can speak to this directly. She actually is uh, coordinating with a subject matter expert around a seed grant. More on that later if you have questions about that. Next slide. Oh, actually more on that now. Um, <laughs> So our seed grant opportunities, um, initially we are we were funding uh, five to 20k grants under this project collaboration category. So this is the an example like what I was saying with Kat. So she's working with a subject matter expert that's helping with meteorites, bringing meteorite collections to her project. Um, moving forward, we actually have requested an augmentation from NASA SMD to also include event facilitation and mission liaison grants. So we're looking for ways to do smaller level efforts and larger level, level efforts with many of our subject matter experts. Next slide. All right. And really to get things started, we do need to take an opportunity to acknowledge the land in which we are on. So we are here at Arizona State University in the School of Earth and Space Exploration. And we acknowledge the 22 native nations that have inhabited this land for centuries. Arizona State University's four campuses are located in the Salt River Valley on ancestral territories of indigenous peoples, including the Akimel O'odham, the also known as the Pima River people, Pipash, the Maricopa people, and the Hohokam Indian communities, whose care and keeping of these lands and irrigation canals specifically allows us to be here today. We acknowledge the sovereignty of these nations and seek to foster an environment of success and possibility for Native American students. Next slide, please. And with that, I would formally like to introduce both Kat gardner Vandy and Daniela Scalise, who will bring us in with a word to our creator. All right, Yakoki, Jessica, thank you. Uh, and thank you for the, the land acknowledgement statement. Um, 
Well, I, um, as I was kind of thinking about and preparing for our workshop today, I kept coming back to the fact that it's August and we are starting school and kind of transitioning into this school time. But I also wanted to think about the fact that in Oklahoma and for Choctaw Nation, um, which is uh, the nation which I'm a citizen, um, we call August, um, well, in Choctaw, it's Akas. Um, but it's the month of the peach. So maybe where you are, you have a lot of peaches. We in Oklahoma have lots of peach orchards. And so we spend a lot of time in July and August eating peaches, really just nice, juicy, large peaches. And so today I invite you to join me in thanking our creator for this time and for fruit. So um, while I speak, feel free to turn off your camera um, or enter whatever posture you feel comfortable with. Um, so I have a few words that I've written for us. Uh, to the spirit within us, our creator, I come humbly to offer my words of thankfulness. Thanks for the mother earth who nurtures all that is living in the ground, all that's living on the ground and all that's living above the ground. I come in thanks of the fruit of the earth that nurtures us, that sustains us, that provides us energy to do good work. And I offer a prayer to ask you spirit to bear with us a healthy, fruitful gathering today so that we can um, consider these fruits that we have and continue to grow and bear good works and good things. Uh, Yakoki, thank you. Thank you for joining me. All right, well, now I think we are moving on to um, a time where Daniela and I will introduce ourselves. So uh, Daniela, if you could introduce yourself, please. Oh, and you're muted, friend. I am muted, all right. Good afternoon, everybody. My name is Daniela Scalise. It's great to be with you. Thank you for those beautiful words, Kat. And thank you, Jessica, for making this workshop possible. Um, my, I already said my name. Let's see, what else can I tell you? Oh, I am the Education and Communications Lead for NASA's Astrobiology Program. I've been with NASA for the past 22 years, serving and, and working with all different kinds of learners from informal to formal education settings, higher education, and, um, I've had the, the great privilege of being partnered with and in relationship with many different Native nations, tribes, bands, and communities across the U.S. and Canada for the better part of all that time. So over to you, Kat. Thank you, Daniela. Um, well, I'm Kat Gardner-Vandy, and I'm an assistant professor of aviation and space at Oklahoma State University, uh, and I'm the PI for the Native Earth Native Sky Project that Jessica already mentioned. Um, I am a scientist by training. I have a bachelor's degree in geology from the University of Oklahoma, and uh, let's see, I have a PhD in planetary sciences from the University of Arizona, and then um, I did a postdoc at the Smithsonian, so I really love to think about uh, the curation of meteorites and materials that we have um, in the natural world. All right, so that was one way that we can introduce ourselves. I would like to hear you introduce yourself again, Daniela, please. Thanks, Kat. Bear with me, everyone. I've written this out, and I'm going to sort of read it to you. But this is my, um, my other introduction, and Kat's going to follow me on this. Greetings, my relatives. I greet you in gratitude, humility, and respect. My name is Daniela Scalise. I'm so grateful for the opportunity to be alive today and share this sacred time with you all. Thank you especially to Jessica for inviting me into this space. I am physically female. I identify as a woman and my pronouns are she, her. I'm of European descent and I'm a white settler colonialist on this continent occupying stolen lands. My people came here in the late 19th and early 20th centuries from the areas known today as Ireland, Denmark, and Sicily. They came seeking the economic opportunities created by other white settler colonialists on stolen land by stolen bodies during forced labor. I grew up in what is known by some today as Connecticut one of two daughters of a doctor and a nurse, both of whom were the first in their families to go to college. And the, each of their parents were the first in their families to be born on this continent. My father grew up very poor in downtown Manhattan and my mother somewhat, um, somewhat poor as well, uh, both, both in New York City, she's from the Bronx. Despite this, I grew up in extreme privilege and was fully conditioned and racialized into whiteness. By way of land acknowledgement, which I've decided to stop calling land acknowledgement and start calling colonization acknowledgement, 
<laughs> I live today on the stolen unceded lands of the Piscataway people, known by some today as Annapolis, Maryland, United States, and I pay a monthly tax for my uninvited occupation. These lands hold and recall the blood and tears of those from whom it was stolen, as well as those who were stolen from Africa and forced to labor upon it, as well as their descendants who were persecuted and lynched upon it, and their descendants who still today are marginalized, oppressed, over-policed, incarcerated, and murdered upon it. I'm fully engaged in ongoing and forever education in why and how the capitalist, colonial, Christian, imperialist patriarchy came to become the dominant culture we are living in today. I am here to keep learning and unlearning so that I can be in this world each day going forward in a reparative and restorative way that is fully aligned to justice, healing, and collective liberation. Thank you again for the opportunity to be with you. Over to you, Kat. Nyakoki, Daniela. Halito. Sahochito yat Kat Gardner Vandy, Chahatasia Hoki. Hello, all of my friends. Um, it's so nice to see everyone. Um, my name is Kat Gardner Vandy, and I'm a proud citizen of the Choctaw Nation of Oklahoma. Um, I am speaking to you today from my home in Tulsa, Oklahoma, where I live very close to the Arkansas River, uh, whose waters wax and wane in helpfulness to the people of Tulsa. Uh, it is land that is federally recognized as the land owned and taken care of by the Muscogee Nation of Oklahoma, and I am very honored to be a guest here. Uh, I come today with thankfulness uh, in my heart. I'm so thankful to all of you who decided to join us today. I'm thankful for Daniela, who I get to work with so often and enjoy doing so, uh, and for Jessica and the SCOPE team who worked really hard to put all of this together and to uh, orchestrate all of you being here. Um, I am female uh, and of mixed European and Native American ancestry. My mother's family originated in Europe and eventually landed in the Midwest. And my father's father's family was Choctaw. And they migrated to what is now Broken Bow, Oklahoma, which is in the very southeastern part of the state, uh, but at that time was just called Indian Territory, um, which was, as you may know, a state that became riddled with broken treaties and assimilation and hatefulness and groups of people who were afraid to be considered Native American. Um, my father's family migrated all around Oklahoma uh, and then settled in Broken Arrow, Oklahoma, right outside of Tulsa, which is where he met my mother and they got married and then had my sister and then me. So today I live on land near where I grew up, not exactly where I grew up, but near where I grew up. And I am a wife, um, a mother of four. I'm a sister, a daughter, a teacher, and a lifelong learner of the earth and the sky. I am a person of privilege. I grew up with my needs met, and I live now with my needs met. And my white skin means that I did not meet the racism that other Native people in Oklahoma and elsewhere often see. And as such, I live with a really great responsibility to serve others in any capacity that I have. Uh, I live in constant gratitude of my family, my friends, and my mentors. Yakoki, we're so happy that you're here with us, and I'm so happy to meet you all. Okay, so those were two very different types of introductions. Um, we are wondering, and um, would maybe see in the chat or if you could even uh, speak out some of the differences that you saw between those two types of introductions that we gave you. Definitely see comment that that was beautiful. Thank you. Silos versus community. Uh, vulnerability within the second intros. We have a hand raised. Um, both express gratitude. And yeah, Yasmin. Yes, uh, thank you so much. I just wanna say that um, it, um, it's very, you, very notorious that you can find a difference between the two introductions. From the, sec and the second introduction, it really helped me to connect with you in a different way. I am uh, I am a Mapuche woman. I am from the Native American um, Mapuche community from the south of Chile, and uh, it really 
I can connect with you in a different way when I hear your second introduction that really makes me see yourself through with a different lens. I think, yeah. Thank you, Yasmin. And uh, Genevieve notes in the, in the chat that the second introduction was focused on showing your place in the community and your family. Um, it was more personal with emphasis on identity and family story. There's much less focus on demonstrating knowledge through academic accomplishments and more on the person as part of a community and history. Um, and Lee makes note, she says, this sounds ridiculous, but the second was much longer. And in our Western dominated time crunch culture, we sometimes think we don't have time for these rich connections. Um, I felt more related to the speakers through the second introduction. This is great. Thank you, everyone. We wanted to um, start our workshop about relationality and relationships with um, a little activity where we could model one way in which to express relationality and relationships, which is how we introduce ourselves. And as many of you are noticing or noting in the chat, um, in our second introductions, we situated ourselves with respect to family, with respect to land, the cat so beautifully with land and sky and mother earth and, um, and our histories and our purposes and, and our relatives. So that was our, our attempt at a relational way of introducing ourselves. And we invite you to bring this into your, your lives in all the places and spaces where you would introduce yourself. And we're gonna give you opportunity to practice that right now. <laughs> so we have created breakout rooms and we're putting you in groups of two. It is intentional that we're putting you in these small groups. We're gonna give you about five minutes in your breakout room. People leave when we said breakout room. Um, <laughs> um, we're gonna put you in these groups of two in the breakout room for about five minutes and give you an opportunity to practice introducing yourself in this relational way. Um, so we'll go ahead and get started. Um, let's see, Sina, will you open up the breakout rooms? Yep, in just a second, I'm adjusting the numbers with our changes. Okay, here Sina, we go. Sina, can you put uh, Rihanna and Maine in a group with two other people? So her room's a group of three, please. Are folks in breakout rooms now? Looks like they're heading off right now. Great. Okay. Thanks, Sina. I uh, left my breakout room. <laughs> I was in two, if you can put me back for a couple seconds. <laughs> We are going to come back into group mode. Everyone's going to be here. We go. Oh, okay. Meeting is being recorded. Uh, sorry, Sandlin, I missed the end of your intro. is being recorded. Well, hello everyone and welcome back. Hopefully you had a good five minutes to kind of get started and do a little bit of practicing. Um, so what we wanted to do right now is to just give you an opportunity to share your thoughts on that practice. So now that you've had time to kind of participate in it yourself, what new thoughts do you have? And you can share via chat or you can speak out here. Uh, 
I know it was fun to practice. You wish you had more time. Ah, we probably should have scheduled more time. You're probably right on that one. Uh, Yasmin. Yes, uh, thank you. I just wanna say that it was great to have the little practice with, with someone. Um, I used to do, the, uh, I do presentations about Cosmovision of the Universe from the Mapuche community from South of Chile, um, but I never had, a, I, I do present a little bit of myself, but what I heard today on this presentation, it was more and more deep, that it really helps you to connect with the presenter, and also um, more than connect to when, then when the person start presenting and talking about the topic they had for the meeting, then you understand and you see where those coming from, so you get a more clarity why this person maybe is talking or saying what it's saying because you know a little bit more about the background of the person that is there. Absolutely. Um, I also note, Lee said it was surprising how much you could share within such a short amount of time. Um, it was great to be able to practice. Um, some note that it was in fact difficult um, knowing less about family history. Um, do you have any recommendations for somebody who may have less understanding of their family history? How they might be able to introduce themselves in a more relational way? Well, there are many ways to situate yourself in relationship and be relational when talking about yourself that doesn't even necessarily have to draw on your ancestry. Um, that's usually something that comes up quickly, but you can talk about, you know, your relationship to plant life or as you were saying, cat, earth and sky, and um, maybe you have children or maybe you don't and you want to talk about that. And that's part of your relationship to all that is. So I wouldn't worry about it too much. It'll come to you. Mm -hmm. And I see a hand raised by Kate. Yep. Hi, Kate here with Amelia, and uh, we are Glass Education, and I found it very uncomfortable to uh, get out of that um, expression. You know, I'm always pitching who we are as an organization and where we, you know, where we are as a group, and um, and so putting my credentials out there so people will take me seriously. So this idea of stepping back and, and doing, or not even stepping back, stepping into a different way of, of representing yourself was, is very odd. But I also did, went to Australia to a number of workshops in Australia and they are much more farther along in this type of just this practice in general with um, in conferences and groups. And everyone seems to be much more comfortable with that. and and. And I look forward to just sort of stepping into that a little bit more and maybe we can get, get to that practice more easily in the future by just trying. Thanks, Kate. This is Daniela. I just wanted to say that, you know, our credentials and our schooling and, and our accomplishments in our professional world aren't necessarily, they're certainly not bad things and they're not necessarily not relational. Just, when we lead with that and we move into the space with that, like you said, so people will take us seriously or whatever, you know, whatever, that introduces power dynamics that we can let go of in order to actually connect with each other. And when we authentically connect with each other in relationality, that's where the real power is. So yes, I wanna know where you went to school. I would like to know, you know, what your accomplishments are. I wanna celebrate you. I don't wanna compete with you. You know what I mean? Okay, should we move on? Thanks everyone for, for this. I'm gonna share screen again, bear with me. I, I will also note while you're transitioning, there are so many additional great comments in the chat. So if you both, I mean, at any time, take a, take a read, outstanding comments there. Thanks everyone for stretching into that space. Okay, we have a, a, another section here that I think we would also consider somewhat introductory with respect to you know, we're not jumping into, okay, how to do relationships. We wanna pause first, we wanna um, ground a little bit in some history with respect to relationships and indigenous communities. So I wanna just share, Kat and I wanna share these ideas with you um, 
they may be shocking, they may be jarring, they may be difficult, uncomfortable, as you were saying, Kate, but we wanna, we wanna share this and we wanna talk about it with you. Um, as people, I'll just read off, as people who hold power in the dominant society, as many of us on this call do, and I'll speak for myself, I do, I have been granted that power, we are already in relationship with indigenous communities. And again, speaking for myself, what I've learned is that it's, it's violent. It has a history of violence. Um, as, we, as I mentioned, at least in my introduction, we, I talked about um, colonization and stolen lands and stolen bodies and stolen and forced labor and things like that. Um, with respect to indigenous communities, this is, this is the history of the pre-existing relationship between, for example, myself as a white woman here in the US and indigenous communities here on Turtle Island. So I'd like to um, explore these ideas with you and your feelings about that with you uh, through this image. This image has a name. It is called American Progress. And my it's blocked for me. I can move some stuff here. There we go. Um, but I think it says, yeah, circa 1873. And many of you have probably seen this image before. I hadn't until a few years ago, but, um, but it's extremely powerful. So I just wanted to, to share this with you and have you spend a little time seeing into it and feeling into it and noting what you observe and what you feel for that matter in this context of what is the history of relationship between white settler colonialists and um, colonization broadly, and those who hold power today because of all of that, and indigenous communities. So feel free to express things in the chat if you're moved to do so, or you can raise your hand and we'll, we'll hear from you. Have you seen this image before? Have you interacted with it? I can start with a little narration. There's a, a white female figure here um, who's literally laying cable <laughs> for what is probably communications or electricity perhaps. Um, the, lots of things are following her and, and sort of coming with her. There's agriculture that's coming with her, um, transportation, the rail, the stage and the rail, um, the covered, iconic covered wagons. Um, thanks, Kat. The darkness on the left, yes. And I was gonna add to that the lightness on the right that she's kind of bringing to the darkness perhaps. Yep, Maggie's also seeing the shadow. Right, so a lot of dark and light in the chat. Yes, the, even the sort of celebrated you know, movement of the enlightenment carries its own power as a word. Uh, it carries the power dynamic of colonialism as a word. Wildlife is running away. Yes, okay, good. So, and, and very specifically, uh, the buffalo are running away. And very specifically, folks who are in traditional regalia indicating that they are native to this continent um, are running away, are being chased, I should say. So, um, and I think there's a bear in the bottom left-hand corner. Also, um, there's no place for them here. They are being chased away, they're being erased. So this is literally called American progress. So I wanted to just share this with you as the foundation for us to ground in as we think about building relationships with indigenous communities. We're already in one and this is what it looks like. Yes, please do keep going in the chat. I'm gonna to go to the next slide. So the first, this is the same sentence as before, but I changed the word um, from people to educators, just wanting to speak to the relation, the pre-existing relationship 
between ourselves, uh, most of us, and indigenous communities with respect to education that kind of brings in another layer here. And I wanna explore that layer with you in this image. Curious if anyone has seen this image before. Um, this is students at the Carlisle Indian Industrial School, which was, if my understanding is correct, the very first uh, Indian boarding school in the United States. This is around the same time, 1890, circa 1890. This is in Pennsylvania, Carlisle, Pennsylvania. And um, I suspect most of you have been aware of and keeping tabs on what's happening right now with a lot of um, attention to what went on in the boarding schools across the US and Canada. Um, and we have, as you probably already know as well, um, a Native American woman serving as Secretary of the Interior, um, the cabinet that governs the Bureau of Indian Affairs. And she has commissioned a study of, or a preliminary study really, of the boarding school situation, the federal Indian boarding school policy. And I'm gonna put some links in the chat to all of this. Um, here in the United States. It was a federal policy, just like we have other federal policies today, like we used to have Roe v. Wade, like that. Um, we used to have certain rights and protections. This was a policy by the federal government that basically established these schools. Many of them, I hasten to add, were run by um, the church, the Christian church, and mostly the Catholic church. So there's a big thread of that weaving into all of this too. and. Um, and basically after the quote unquote Indian Wars died down, um, and my, my interpretation of that is that after genocide became socially unacceptable as the first federal policy to deal with literally quote unquote the Indian problem, um, boarding schools, this policy came through, take the children away. Um, there's a, a quote by a man, I should have put this in here, I apologize who was um, a white man in Canada at the time, who was also instituting these policies, who um, said, save the, in no, save, kill the Indian, save the man. And this was how, was to bring them into these educational, the white man's education system. Um, again, taking them away from their family, home, culture, lands, everybody. And now we're seeing through that preliminary report I mentioned, and through other headlines in the news, um, the absolute brutality, physical and otherwise, that was going on in these places and spaces, and the echoes of which are very real today um, for people who are survivors. So what I ultimately wanted to do with this piece of it, again, to demonstrate there's already a relationship in place specifically with respect to education. And many of us on this call identify as educators, STEM educators, and many of us would want to and do um, work in, in and with and for Native communities to do education. And I wanna make sure we understand the link between what we do today and what our ancestors did a number of years ago. So again, inviting your thoughts and feelings into the chat for this, but we're gonna do a jam board on all your thoughts and feelings as well. So let me close this section with, um, with the heavy section with just, some encouraging words. We have a huge opportunity. Awareness is the first step. And um, we should cultivate this opportunity to break down these colonial imbalanced power dynamics and do our work as educators and as people in a good way. Get informed, be informed. Know that this is the history that we take with us when we work um, with our native partners of doing education. And we're gonna move on in, in the workshop to talk about building relationship and trust toward co-creativity and service. Okay, we are going to do a Jamboard to process this together. Um, so I believe Jessica and Sina are gonna put a link to the Jamboard in the chat. So please do go to the chat and click on that link. All you should have to do is click on it, I believe. Okay, I'm going to stop and Jessica's going to start sharing. So then we can, um, we can process this together. Yes, so we chose to go with the Jamboard because it is a way for you to be able to document your thoughts anonymously, but also give you the opportunity to be able to process the information. Um, 
We know that this may take a few moments, especially if this has been the first time you've heard this. It may take you a bit to process it, think through it, kind of come to terms with the new information that you've received today. So we've dropped the link to the, jam, the Jamboard over into the chat. Um, as you process your thoughts, you'll see over here on the left-hand side, you have a toolbar. What we're gonna ask you to do is to add what's called a post-it. So let me do that one more time. So the third one here, or the fourth one here, the one that's under the arrow is a sticky note. And so you'll get a little pop-up. You can type your, whatever your text is and hit save. And then when you're done typing your little notes, you can grab your note and place it wherever on the Jamboard you wish. We also want to give you ample time to kind of process that and also give you an opportunity for a bio break at this point. Uh, so we said that we would probably give you about 10 minutes to reflect, do your bio break, and then we will all come back together and continue our progress forward. We'll be here with any question or to be able to answer any questions that you have over the course of the 10 minutes. We'll see you soon. Okay. Jessica, I can share again if you stop sharing. Okay, this is over to Kat. Awesome. Thank you, Daniela. Um, I, I was really blown away reading all of those jam boards. So I'm, I'm sort of sitting in that space right now. Um, so I really appreciate you all participating in that. Um, what, one thing that Daniela and I wanted to spend a moment chatting about, which we really could, we could talk about this for hours. I'm going to try to do my best to to whittle this kind of concept down into just a few minutes um, with the idea that I'm no expert on this. I'm just going to give you my perspectives. Um, but we wanted to, to chat for a moment about this idea of relationships and relationality and how relationships are the very heart of the indigenous life, indigenous life ways. This is the very heart of how indigenous people think and breathe and do things within their community and within their space and how they plan. So I wanted to just talk about that concept for a few minutes. Um, there's a phrase um, that you may have mm -hmm. heard before. Um, there's a, I, and I, I don't know the Lakota words and I apologize for that, but there's this phrase, all my relations that you may have heard before. There's actually a podcast that's really fantastic called all my relations. Um, but it comes from this Lakota translation, this prayer that, that basically says all my relations are all my relatives. And that it's this idea that we are all related. And when I say we, I don't mean in this uh, Lakota prayer is not meaning we humans are all related. It means that all living things things on the earth are related and that all of the things that encompass the earth and the sky and inside of the earth are all related as well. So there's this relationality between not only us as humans, but all the other animals and plants and living beings, insects that are on the earth, um, as well as the, the ground and the sky and the water and everything all around us. We all have this interrelationship, this interconnectedness that we live with all the time. And that is what really is the foundation of this respect of nature and respect for one another um, in indigenous life ways. Um, and this is it's a big concept to, to think about, um, and I encourage you to just sort of sit with that for a little while um, and and see, you know, whether you agree with that or whether you were brought up in such a way to think this way. Um, I was um, rereading or I am re-listening, I guess you could say, I love audiobooks, um, to uh, Braiding Sweetgrass by Robin Wall Kimmerer, and she has a really um, interesting thought to put into this, and she is discussing in the book how humans, homo sapiens, um, have this idea, at least in the Western tradition, that we are somehow at the top of this hierarchical chain of beings on this planet, and that 
we, you know, have sort of the purview of every other species. And that if we need something that we just take it without asking. And um, I love the way she connects it to time, which is something we'll get to a, a, a few moments um, later in this talk or in our, in our workshop, but it's the indigenous idea of time. And she discusses how, when we think about the geologic perspective, when we think of the earth perspective, we as a species, Homo sapiens, have been on this planet for such a short amount of time. And when we think about other species, they've been on this planet for much longer. They have much more wisdom than we do about the earth and about the interconnectedness of how to live on the earth and what it means. And so I love that she goes into that book about the ways in which we humans should be learning from all the other creatures that live on this earth and have done so much longer than we have um, and who are experts in the earth as opposed to us which is such an antithetical view to how most Western societies view other creatures and other creations um, inside the earth. So in taking this um, idea and, and pushing it towards what, what we may be talking about today, which is relationship building, if we're gonna be doing work or education or anything, it's a reminder to us that with the indigenous lifeways and how indigenous communities often operate, the relationships that we have with each other and with those institutions that we're working with are much more important than the work itself. The relationships that I have with the native communities I work with are so much more important than the curriculum that we're building. And that is hard for many institutions to recognize and understand. It's secondary. The, the work that we're doing is so secondary to the relationships and the people. And this is so beautiful because it keeps everything very human centric and people centric. Um, so the, thus the, the point of this workshop and some of the things that you um, may have heard from Daniela and I in the past, relationships come first and the work comes second. All right, Daniela, if you could move over to the next slide. Um, I wanted to share for a moment um, and again, this is something we could talk about for a very long time, but I wanted to share for a moment about the indigenous cultural perspective of science uh, and, and sort of how we define science and, you know, what is science and how do indigenous communities view science versus the way Western, uh, you know, colonialized institutions view science. So this, this is a topic that's particularly near and dear to my heart. Um, I think it's very interesting and in telling that the word science comes from the Greek word scientia, which just means knowledge just knowledge. Yet the way that we view science in the westernized way is very much um, a type of institution where we might measure something, we might discover something, we might ask a question so that we can understand something. And all of those things, all the things that we tend to do within Western science um, have a lot to do with domination, domination of a topic or sort of an entitlement to understand and to always recognize that something is going to be this way because I have figured it out and it's going to always stay that way. A lot of times westernized science, what we consider science, um, is pretty linear. We might have a question in mind that we decide on a hypothesis for and ask that question, but that doesn't change. We don't change our hypothesis. We, we decide to collect data and we decide to analyze that data and then make some sort of new conclusion based upon that. And then that's our scientific discovery or that's our effort. But everything that an indigenous community would say is part of native science or how we might define native science is really antithetical to that. It is more relational. It is going to be less linear. It's going to be much more cyclical in its nature. It's going to be so much more about making an observation as opposed to discovering or dominating some sort of thing that we're trying to learn about. Um, it's also going to be very representative of our relationship with that thing as opposed to measuring that thing and, and saying something about it. So the real focus of native science or indigenous science is really focusing on observing what my relationship is to that thing, not how I fully understand that thing or the, that I fully should be entitled to understand that thing. Um, indigenous science or native science really brings not only your mind into the, the work that you're doing, which is very much a westernized view as well, but it also brings your body and your emotion and your spirit and the land and all the other creatures that you're in relationship as well. So that's different. Um, so one concept that I uh, would like to tell you about quickly is a concept called two-eyed seeing. Um, maybe you've heard of it before. I hope you have. Um, if not, there's a lot of resources that um, I can put out there and uh, maybe 
put you in touch with so that you can learn a little bit more. But um, within our Native Earth, Native Sky uh, Science Activation Program, we do a lot of our curriculum building based upon this idea of two-eyed seeing. And so this, um, this idea came about from a Mi'kmaq elder named uh, Elder Albert Marshall um, from Canada. And he started discussing this, uh, I think in the early 2000s. But the idea of two-eyed seeing is that you take the strengths of both indigenous science and Western science and use each one as a lens. And the recognition that you're not getting full sight or you're not getting full two-eyed seeing unless you use both of those lenses. In two-eyed seeing, you're not seeing that native science and westernized science are in competition with one another. You're seeing them as having a relationship with one another, the reciprocity between indigenous science and, and westernized science. And the idea there is that you just have those two things being interrelated consistently. You can say that they're braided together or they're interwoven together, but they come together synergistically consistently so that you have that full sight. Um, and I have here, this is just um, a, a little chart that might be helpful in some of the ways we might describe these two types of science and get your mind starting to think about the ways in which you might braid together those two different things. So if native science is really geared towards um, the relationship aspect and reciprocity and making sure that we're being responsible, we can add that to hypotheses that we make and data collection that we do and analysis. Uh, in some ways, it feels a little bit like marrying qualitative work and quantitative work. So you can think of it that way as well. Um, there's so much more to say about this, but um, I um, there, and there may be some things in the chat that people have put. Otherwise, I'll put a few uh, sources in the chat. I also have a great list of books if you are so interested in these ideas of, number one, what Native science is and what Indigenous authors have discussed about it, but also um, having more Indigenous type of science into curriculum. So there are several books that I can put into the chat that talk about the educational aspect of um, including two-eyed seeing or including indigenous science within the things that we create. And I want to say, do we have a moment? I want to say we're going to do a moment where uh, we do a waterfall chat. So um, think for a moment about what, what I've kind of presented to you um, about indigenous science and native science and, you know, conversely, Western science, and how those two combine and come together. And um, think for a moment about what that might look like um, and what your thoughts and feelings might be as you process these two things, particularly for those of us, maybe all of us, who were very much educated in Western science tradition. Um, think about that for a moment. And then, Jessica, if you want to lead the waterfall chat. Sure, absolutely. Yeah, thank you. So, uh, waterfall chat is intended to be something where you're gonna you're gonna type your response, but don't hit enter. We will wait until a queue, and everyone will hit enter at once, and then we'll see the entire chat fill up with all of your comments with your reflection. So, we'll give you just a moment here to ponder and type your comment, but don't hit enter. It's really hard to resist that urge, but resist it. We shall resist. Okay. I'm going to give you it until it says 04 on the clock. 104, 204, 304, 404. You guys are doing amazing. Longest minute ever. <laughs> oh, all right. On my mark. Three, two, one, enter. So many comments. So many comments. This is amazing. All right. Daniela Cat, you guys got a lot to process here. Do you want me to just kind of read through and you can comment back? Would that help? Yeah, pick out one or two. Okay. 
Let's see, Randy says, I have experienced braided learning and I would love to be able to teach this way because it is so rich, but I don't feel authentic in that yet and hope that will change someday. There is no care work in science. Science doesn't intersect with caring in the way I've been educated. Let's see, Western science is presented as linear, but in, it certainly is more non-linear than we like to admit. Probably has more overlap than Western scientists would admit. Native sciences and Western sciences are equal. Hey, that's cat. <laughs> um, indigenous peoples are experts in their place. I've always loved seeing science from a broader perspective and this viewpoint truly brings me joy. It makes me excited about my field again. Um, in comparison to other science disciplines, it feels like the earth environmental sciences have a lot of potential to consider scientific questions with relationality. Ah, oh, this is a good one. The challenge of influencing people that don't feel that indigenous science and ways of knowing are important and should be included in our scientific dialogue. Anxious at the challenge. <laughs> the Western academia part of my brain wants to resist this because it's very counter to how we are taught or the scientist is supposed to be the objective and distinct from the world around them. Yes, there is indeed a lot to unlearn. <laughs> unlearn and relearn. Why don't we move on? Let's see. Okay, I think this is me, Kat. So on our theme of relationships and relationality, we want to get into well, what do we mean? What does that mean? Um, how do we do this? And I wanted to, the next slide, lay a little bit more foundation, probably our final brick in the foundation before we kind of go into, all right, how do we really do this? Let's practice. Um, and to share with you that relationships with respect to um, indigenous communities, there needs to be some things that are prerequisite, if you like. Um, this idea of tribal, tribal sovereignty and self-determination. And as we were just hearing from you, Kat, and processing in the waterfall chat, the ability, uh, so to speak, to hold multiple worldviews, multiple bodies of knowledge, multiple ways of knowing, methods to generating knowledge, scientific, westernized science is just one of them, as we heard. Um, and so how do we hold those as equal? equally valid, equally true. Like, you know, my knowledge that of a scientific fact is just as true as, um, as an indigenous community member's knowledge of why the sky is blue, for example. Absolutely equal validity and trueness. Equal value, that's different um, than validity. I should have put that on the slide. So that's, as you've noted in the chat, potentially a tall order for some of us, um, for others who are, who are not here, perhaps even more so. So, but I would suggest that these two ideas, tribal sovereignty and self-determination um, and holding multiple worldviews is equally valid and valuable are, are foundational to developing relationships, especially with respect to educational partnerships, but research partnerships as well. Um, with indigenous communities. So with those two things as the sort of strongest pieces um, and biggest threads, we can actually start to weave them together into a much stronger, um, stronger together foundation of relationships represented in this braid. And once that you know, starts to get woven, then we have a proper foundation for building trust, authentic service through co-creativity. And we're gonna talk more about what, especially co-creativity and authentic service look like 
topic, but but trust to first order, just to put some words around that. I think we all instinctively and perhaps viscerally know what trust is through how it feels. Um, I would just offer the words that trust is in place when someone's words and actions are in alignment. Basically, you you do what you say you're going to do. So um, so anyway, this is kind of just a one last piece of foundation with respect to the how to and of building relationships in indigenous communities. So with that, I think it's over to you, Kat. Yes, thank you, Daniela. So um, at, at this part in the workshop, um, Daniela and I would like to kind of present to you all um, what it might look like. So something very practical and realistic that you may be able to sort of start to picture in your mind about what it might look like to have a relationship with an Indigenous community, or perhaps if you're considering it, begin building a relationship with an Indigenous community. And so we would uh, like to present to you, you know, what the ideas are that we have, some of our kind of you know, best practices, wise guidelines, however you might like to, to define that um, in terms of what it looks like to actually move forward within this and, and give you our recommendations. Um, if you are so inclined to read more about this, Daniela and I wrote a paper for the Decadal Survey, and we could probably put, a, put that in the chat as well. Okay, um, next slide, please. All right, so in terms of stages, and, and we can kind of think of this in, in a, uh, you know, linear fashion, um, which, you know, we can, we can harken back to some, like, whether something's linear, linear or cyclical, this is actually both. Um, but if we do want to think about something in a sort of the timeline type of fashion, the first thing I want to talk about is what you do before initiating a relationship with an Indigenous community. And this part is really, really important. Uh, the first thing that is of utmost necessity to do before you start a relationship with an indigenous community is a lot of self-reflection. And so I mean self-reflection on a personal level, so your own self, but I also mean self-reflection on your program or your institution or whoever it is that you're working for and representing. This is really important because there needs to be an honest assessment of why you personally are, are thinking about doing this work and why your institution or your program is interested in doing this work. Um, are you doing it because it's the right thing to do and you should be doing it? Uh, are you doing it because there's a lot of diversity initiatives going on uh, within your institution and um, you, you know your institution would like for you to do it? Uh, was it someone else's idea? Was it your idea? Was it something that you heard about someone else doing? And so you think, okay, well, I can do that too. Or is it something that is so deeply rooted in you and important to you that you are willing and ready to take on the responsibility of having that relationship with an Indigenous community? It's very self-reflective. It needs to happen first so that you recognize whether you have the time and the capacity to have this relationship. Or if the answer is no, there's no judgment there, but that would mean that you should not initiate a relationship. All right, so after that self-reflection piece, um, and if you've decided that, yes, you know, your, your heart is in this, you're ready for relationality, you're ready for relationship, and you do have the time and capacity to do so, the next step is still very personal. It's still very related to you and your program and your institution, and that is to do your own work, do your own research, uh, learn as much as you can about that community. Um, I can't speak for all communities, but I can speak... Um, not to represent Choctaw Nation, but I can speak to my experiences with Choctaw Nation as a citizen. We have a lot of resources that are available to the public. We have a monthly newspaper that goes out. We have a beautiful cultural center that opened about a year ago and is open to the public. We have a headquarters where people are allowed to come in and speak with others and visit the gift shop and find a lot of great books and texts all about Choctaw Nation. So these are some of the things that you can do on your end. Um, you can see with whatever community it is that you're going to be working with, you know, probably someone who's very near to where you work or live, uh, and go visit, go find resources, go do a lot of that research on your own to find out about them. Who are they? Where did they come from? Where did they move from? Were they forcibly removed? And where from? What are their traditions? 
And most importantly, what is important to them? What's important to their community? What's going on right now? If you find that they uh, are you know, looking for a particular type of camps to have, or they're doing a lot of camp, well, then maybe that would be something that they could be interested in. If you find that they're dealing with health crises and um, housing issues, well, maybe you could help with that. And it would just be different than what that um, initial idea was that you had for initiating a relationship. All right. Um, in this kind of pre-stage, so before initiating a, initiating a relationship, there's a couple of things to really make sure you have a solid and heartfelt understanding of. Uh, the first of which uh, Daniela has mentioned, um, and that's really understanding and respecting sovereignty. So sovereignty is, it's a, it's a complicated word and it's a bit hard to describe, but for me, sovereignty means authority. So a nation has the ultimate authority over their land their space, their people, their knowledge systems, all of those things. And they have their own self-determination. It has nothing to do with what my institution wants or what someone else wants or what I want. It is theirs. They have the sovereignty. So make sure you really understand what that means um, and can take that to heart because that's going to be a foundation for that relationship if you should have that in the future. And just as we were just discussing in our in our waterfall chat, sort of the, the differences between native science and, and westernized science, really make sure that you've reached a place where you hold multiple knowledge systems as equally valuable and meaningful. So if you find that you're just, you're still struggling with that and you really have to unlearn some of those things, that's okay. But do some of that work ahead of time. Make sure that when you initiate relationships, you've really found that place in yourself to know that those two different systems, while they may be different, some of the things may be similar, but they are equally valuable. All right, next slide, please. All right, so uh, once all of those things have taken place and perhaps you are ready, perhaps you say, you know, I would like to initiate a relationship with this uh, community that is near me, you know, what would that look like? Um, Daniela and I have a list here, it's not exhaustive, but a list of things that you need to consider and think about when initiating a relationship. Uh, first and foremost is to make sure that you are going to that community with an open mind. And I have here a picture of open hands, an open mind and open hands. Uh, and what I mean by that is that you don't come to initiate that relationship with something preconceived already. You don't have an idea in mind already. You don't have an ask for them. Or um, I love Daniela said to me, a full plate. You don't come to them with something. You just come as you. You come as yourself. You come as your institution, ready to have conversations and to talk, but not to ask them for something. An example might be, you know, we are looking to have an event and we want you to come to participate in it, or we are going to write a paper and we want your perspective in that paper. Those would be asks. So make sure that when you're initiating a relationship, you're just going with an open mind and an open heart, ready to see and talk together about the needs of the community. All right, secondly, if you, um, you know, ask for a meeting or that you ask for a discussion time um, and you are invited to visit, make sure that you enter into that space with a lot of humility. Um, listen more than you speak. I know that in many cases, especially with westernized science, we're really taught um, to really make sure that our idea gets heard and really make sure that we can answer that question and, and go into great detail. But with a Native community, it's and going to initiate that relationship, it's all about you listening, listening to what they need, listening to their perspective, listening to their stories, and seeing in which ways you might have something to bring to bear to what they have to bring to bear. And that's the reciprocity. Within that, it's recognizing that you're not the expert they are. They're an expert in their community, in their home, in their place, in their science, their earth, their sky, their water, all of those things. Um, with that means prioritizing the needs of their community and not prioritizing your needs, whether it's your personal needs or whether it's your institution or program's needs. Um, when you do have a meeting, make sure that you focus on getting to know one another. Really bring your whole self, who you are, just like the, the relational introductions that we did. Bring all of you, not just Kat the scientist, but Kat 
everything else, all of me, all of my heart and everything that I do, that is being authentic in that relationship. And uh, the final note here is that um, when you have this meeting, if you are to go in person um, and then after, make sure that you um, have a lot of gratitude and then have a note of gratitude afterwards. It's also very um, special and important to native communities to oftentimes have a gift, some kind of memento. This does not have to be something that is uh, big and showy, that kind of gift. It's something very heartfelt. Um, and so we can talk about that a little bit more if, um, if you all here uh, would like to hear more about that. Uh, let's go to the next slide. All right, so after the initiation of the relationship and perhaps having um, a meeting of some kind, um, let's talk a little bit about some of the best guidelines for building that relationship. So you may have met um, and talked about maybe their needs and maybe some of the ways in which you might have something to bring to bear but that's not yet building a relationship. So what are some of the things that we can do to build a relationship? Um, first, uh, when you think about this relationship building, I wanna really impress upon the fact that it's going to take time. Uh, my greatest mentor, Tim McCoy from the Smithsonian, who's a member of the Miami tribe, always said to me time and time again, that um, relationships move at the speed of trust. And Daniela mentioned trust already. And that fact needs to be something that we really ruminate on quite a bit that we cannot rush, we cannot stress a timeline or some sort of action to come out of this. So we really have to be prepared to spend the time to grow the relationship. The community itself needs to lead that. So the westernized institution should not be leading that. The community itself should be leading that. And also be flexible as things change. You may, um, or the community may find that um, their needs have changed or um, that they may or may not be interested in something that had previously been discussed and it may not meet their needs anymore. So just be prepared for change and be um, humble and willing to discuss what that looks like. Um, as I mentioned before about writing notes, um, share of yourself with the community. Uh, one of the things I just love so much about having indigenous communities as partners with Native Earth, Native Sky is that I have so many new friends. And just, just yesterday, I was just texting with one of the gals from the Choctaw Nation Cultural Center just to see how she was doing. I was just thinking about her and wondered, you know, how things were going. She does a lot of activities. And that was it. I didn't ask her about work. I didn't have a question for her. I just wanted to see how she was doing. She is now a friend of mine. Um, so keep that in mind um, as you are building the relationship that it's not just about work or about science or about curriculum building. Um, another thing that is fantastic to do when you're building a relationship is to show up show up for events, show up to things that you may have found as you, for example, were going through a newsletter or a newspaper and found that they were having an event for the community, um, having an event at a cultural center or museum. Um, show up to those, see what they're all about, come and enjoy their culture with them and learn the culture alongside. Likewise, um, if that community ever has a situation where there's an emergency that comes up, provide aid, provide help. Um, I know, again, my, my relationship to the state of Oklahoma, we have a lot of tornadoes and there have been times where communities have been leveled by tornadoes. And so um, there's always an opportunity to see a need in a community and then go help. So in other words, really participate in that community and provide aid if that is necessary. Uh, and I think I already mentioned this, but uh, make sure your relationship is not only scientific or not only about uh, the work that you're doing. Make sure that it is greater than that, because as we've talked about, we are so much more than just our science and our work and, and all these things. We are much more relational than that. All right. One more slide, I think, Daniela. Okay. Um, so a few words here about sustaining a relationship. So um, there's a, a great uh, reminder here about uh, tribal sovereignty, um, of course, but also this idea that um, just because you've done a, a, maybe you've done a camp or maybe you've done curriculum or maybe you've done an event, the relationship is not over. It is sustained and it should be sustained. And so it's something that you should be ready to continue on even after your work, whatever that work was, um, has been completed. 
Um, in doing this, follow your partner's lead. If they want to do more events or do more work, or maybe submit another proposal, whatever it is, continue on, continue on and do that. But if they um, say or seem as though they might need to slow down and take a break, follow their lead. Um, as you're doing work with the communities, make sure that you are getting proper permission and blessings to do the work that you're doing. Um, this can sometimes come in the form of formal letters that comes from tribal elders or leadership. Um, many times within Choctaw Nation, we have the either assistant chief or the chief sign something. So, and it could be something that a westernized institution may not seem like a, such a big deal at all, but the nation itself talks about it with their leadership and then the elders um, to then be signed. So make sure you really know what all those um, checks are that need to happen. Likewise, some nations have an IRB or an institutional review board. Um, and so be really aware of what it looks like and what it means for their IRB um, to be responsibly doing research or doing work with them. A really important point here too is to make sure that you are including the people that you are working with who are translating their knowledge into your program as co-eyes, for example, on your proposal um, or co-authors if you write a paper. This is really important in their sovereignty to make sure that their knowledge is getting credited to them. Um, so really be aware of that as you are moving forward with projects. Another important point is to make sure that your institution or program, whatever it is that you're doing, is ready and willing to continue the relationships. Sometimes personnel changes, and, and that's okay, that happens, but we need to make sure that those relationships can be sustained even if that personnel changes. Uh, and finally, I have a little note here to uh, state that, um, or impress upon everyone that um, we need to recognize that the westernized idea of time um, is very likely not going to be fitting of what that community views as time. Do not rush a community. You know, I think Lee mentioned this, this in the chat in the beginning, you know, we, we don't take the time to really introduce ourselves because we're so busy to get, you know, to get something else accomplished. Um, that time is often taken in indigenous communities. Um, you may go for an interview with an elder. We, we've done this before and it's fantastic. You, you don't plan on how much time that's going to be because you just sit and talk and listen and hear what they have to say. We're not rushing through any of that. Likewise, don't have an expectation that because you're doing a proposal that it could be done next week or the week after. You know, we can't rush any of this process. It has to take time to build that trust. Um, so this, you know, this goes for communications as well. Um, emails, phone calls, you're not entitled to a response right away. You're not entitled to a response today, tomorrow, next week, next month. It may come later. It may come soon. I don't know. But we need to make sure that we are giving the space that's that's required and respected um, and the idea that we're not going to rush the community. Okay, Daniela, I realize I have one more slide and then I'll be done. Um, I, I did want to um, throw out there for, for you all um, some recommendations um, that Daniela and I and our colleagues who are indigenous scholars who helped us write the decadal paper um, uh, to institutions, mostly funding agencies perhaps, but also institutions like universities, and maybe state governments and the, and the federal government on ways in which we need to um, really be thinking about relationship building in some of the policies that we have. So um, it's really, really important that institutions and programs see relationship building and trust building with indigenous populations as important. That means that maybe in solicitations, we have an area where we get funding for relationship building, where there's no requirement of some sort of benchmark or some sort of deliverable at the end. It's relationship building because it's relationship building and it's the right thing to do. Uh, likewise, um, we put that, um, or we believe um, that it's very important for institutions of all varieties to stand up in office of tribal relations. So who can oversee this in the most respectful way? Some uh, federal agencies and state agencies and some other institutions have this already. I love that the USGS has an office of tribal relations. The USDA has an office of tribal relations. It's interesting that NASA doesn't and the NSF doesn't. 
Um, that is something that I really advocate as change and that anyone who is in this kind of um, area who can institute change really be thinking about that. Um, I, I do not want to present Oklahoma State University as um, you know, the, the leader in this or an expert in this, or even that we're doing things absolutely perfectly. But one beautiful, wonderful thing I would like to mention is that our institution has a center for sovereign nations. And part of the responsibilities of the directors of that group are to manage relationships and do relationship building with the 39 federally recognized nations within Oklahoma. It is a very, very beautiful thing. Um, and so I encourage you, if you're interested, you could look up uh, OSU Center for Sovereign Nations. Okay, Daniela, I think that may have been my last one. Wonderful. Thank, Thank you. you. And I apologize if I'm too chatty. Not at all. This is beautiful. We've been speaking, chatting. We've been going for okay. it. But now we are going to um, do another reflection on all this material. We're going to go back to the jam board. I'm going to stop sharing. And we have three new prompts for you with respect to the material you just heard. One is, what do you want to hear more about? And you can do these in any order. Um, what is missing from these suggestions? And are there parts of the stages that you've enacted or experienced? Um, you know, please share. So I'll stop sharing and Jessica is going to take us over to the Jamboard. Okay, the link to the Jamboard is in the chat. And I think Jessica is going to share once again so we can yeah. watch and learn from you. And I also, <clears throat> while, while Kat was talking, added a few slides here if you needed those as reference. So uh, slide three are your reference slides. Questions start on slide four. So slide four, five, and six are your questions. Um, we'll give you, whew, feeling my Western side coming out. We got 30 minutes left, so much to do. Um, <laughs> um, let's, let's go five to seven minutes to add a couple of thoughts here. And then we'll come back for some role playing, I believe. Sorry, I keep it keeps pulling me out of full screen. Apologize for that. There we go. Okay, so our next slide is a fun segment that we hope you'll enjoy. We're, we're calling it role playing, and Kat and I are going to present to each other um, several scenarios that um, theoretical scenarios that may come up that um, are some of which are, are definitely based in real life. So, um, and how with this kind of new information, new ideas flowing through you, how you might interpret these, uh, these scenarios and how you might respond to them. And then we can offer you how we would respond. So let me go to the first one. I think this is the one where I pitch this to Kat. Yes, okay, so Kat. There's an RFP that I'm interested in responding to. And I thought it would be really cool um, if, the, if I used the, the proposal to make an exhibit in the museum I work in to showcase things like constellations and stories of, of you know, Native American tribes uh, in my region. How can I get that information? Do we want to allow time for some responses or should I move quickly? I think we should We should love to see what you have, um, ideas that are flowing in the chat, but it, since yeah. we're a little bit short on time, why don't you go ahead, Kat? Yeah, so um, Daniela, this is really interesting. Um, my first question to you was, are you already in existing relationships with the tribes? No. Okay, so do you have any um, idea about if this is something that they would want to do or something they're needing? No. Okay. This is my idea. Okay, so I recommend that you actually not use an RFP to start a relationship um, because when you do that, that really makes the meeting, that initiation of the relationship being all about an ask. That's saying that you only want to have a relationship with them because of something that they have, which is really their intellectual property, their own data sovereignty, and that you're basically wanting to take it. 
So I can't recommend that you do an RFP with a, a tribe or a nation until you have a relationship with them. Thank you. All right, now, Daniela, um, I have uh, worked for a while on a really fantastic educational product. You know, it's for uh, Cape, you know, let's say elementary school age kids, and um, we have it established. And how can I get native kids and native educators to actually use it? That's a great question. Thank you, Kat. So I'm curious, um, can you tell me a little bit about how you developed this product? And did you have partners when you did that? Were they native? Um, we developed it as part of a NASA program. Um, so with NASA and our NASA partners, um, it was done entirely at our institution um, with the education faculty. Okay, great. Um, so are you in relationships with with tribes at all at this time? Uh, no, we're not. Okay, and I'm curious to do a little bit of reflection with you. What's your motivation for wanting to bring this resource to Native learners? Well, we really think that it's um, a product that has gone over very well with students in our area. And um, we are hoping to get more Native students interested in STEM. Okay, that's a good motivation. I want to share with you some thoughts. Um, a couple things come up for me on this. So because this product was produced with other partners, I assume intended for learners who so far have not been native, um, and it was not co-created with the community, the tribal community that you're interested in bringing it to, that there may be some issues just kind of showing up with a product in hand. Um, the likelihood that the product doesn't align with the needs and desires and realities of tribal communities is potentially high. So that's of concern. Um, also, to bring a, a fully fleshed out product that was created with other you know, partners intended for other learners, um, even if you were to bring that right away into the relationship, that really closes the door on co-creativity. To bring something fully fleshed out and say, let's modify this does not equal co-creation. It really co-creation really has to start with everybody in the same space with respect again to to a power dynamic. We're sharing power here. We're, you know, bringing our ideas to the table. We're brainstorming together. We're guided and led by the needs, desires, and realities of the tribal community. So, so when you do um, start building relationships with communities, you know, again, don't come with a full plate. Come with an empty plate and an open heart and an open mind. Okay. okay. Thank you. All right, scenario number three, Cat. So I'm organizing a retreat for my, pro, my home um, team, my home work team. And we'd like, to, we'd like to organize, you know, we're gonna be in um, Minneapolis and we'd really like to organize an outreach event to the local tribes. Do you have any tips or ideas on how best to do that? Um, well, I have some questions for you. Um, do you have a relationship with the tribes that are in that area that you're planning to attend? No, we're just going to fly in and stay near the hotel or the okay. airport, hotel near the airport. Okay. Um, have you talked to the, the nations or the tribes and asked permission to come onto their land? No. Okay. Um, have you met with any of the other organizers to see if they have existing relationships with these uh, populations? No. No, it's just our little home team. We're about 10 people from all over. Okay, so would you describe the event as mainly being just sort of a one-off outreach event? Yeah, yeah, you know, we're gonna be there. And so we wanted to just share of ourselves and, and take advantage of our presence to bring something to the tribal community. Okay. Um, have you considered um, at this time maybe using a portion of your registration fees or using indirect costs to pay a land tax or maybe to make a donation to the tribe? That's a great idea. We're not okay. really having registration fees, but since we're such a small group and we're sort of intimate already, we could discuss okay. that amongst ourselves. Okay. Just that. 
it sounds to me like you might need to think a little bit more about the relationality aspect that um, since you don't currently have relationships with these nations, it's going to come across that it's a one-off outreach event and that you are helping the nation in some way when there's really no relationship there in the first place. I would definitely recommend considering the land tax or doing a donation to their nation um, in that location where you're having the meeting. And then for future meetings, uh, particularly if you know about the meeting ahead of time, many meetings are done years in advance to start those relationships and start initiating those relationships early so that you can do that with relationship building and then sustain it after the meeting. Wonderful. Thank you very much. Yeah. Okay, number four. This is me to you. Okay. So, um, Kat, as you know, I'm a field geologist and I'm really excited. I haven't been in the field for a couple of years because of COVID. I'm all permitted. I've got all the legal permits in place. I'm ready to go. I'm going to take some samples, but it's all legally permitted. Um, how can you, how would you recommend that I start interacting with the local tribes? I've, I've heard that there's some local people in the area. Okay. So you don't have any, um, any experience with the local tribes at this point? No. Okay. Um, there's always an opportunity to initiate relationship and start relationship building. Um, I wonder though um, about the field site. So is this a place that you're going to be going to multiple times or just the one time? You know, I'm, as you know, I'm starting out in grad school. And so I, I just, and we're funded. I'm a, po you know, I'm a grad student under under so-and-so's research, and I suspect I'll be going every year. Okay, well, well I, I think, yeah, this is a really, um, it's an opportunity for you if you wanted to start relationship building, particularly since you will be going to this nation's land multiple times. Um, I'd like to really encourage you to make sure you recognize that this is not your field site. Um, that the nation itself holds tribal, they, they hold their ancestral and their rights to the land that you want to work on, even if you've gone through all the checks and balances to get permits uh, and that, that you're legally there. So uh, do you think you understand all of those aspects? I think that's something I need to learn more about. I mean, you know, the, the, I, could, I could learn about this, but I don't think it's on a reservation. So well. Yeah. Yeah, even if it's not on a reservation, it is likely still that tribe's ancestral lands. And so you need to be establishing that with them first uh, before you do uh, any sort of observations or science knowledge gaining. Um, I would also uh, really encourage you to include that nation in collaborations and make sure that you're hitting the IRB uh, and doing all the things that that nation has in place first. That's great, thank you. I really wanna be in a good way with the field work. Okay, I think we should skip the next slide. Is everyone in agreement with that? Sure. Okay. So we're gonna go straight into um, another short breakout group period, maybe five or 10 minutes um, with respect to these scenarios that we just presented to you and, and by way of integrating the learning, we're hoping that you will together um, brainstorm clear and definable tasks for your particular projects with respect to relationship building. Um, and we really would love to hear from you on the other side of this. So I'm gonna stop sharing and uh, we're gonna go into breakout groups. And I think we're gonna to have to keep it to about five minutes. So sorry, it's not gonna be a, a, a deep dive, but you guys can get started in your discussion. So Sina, can we open breakout rooms, groups of four? She's golden.
Okay, welcoming everyone back. I think we can make um, a couple of minutes for some sharing about that. Please just raise up your hand or throw some stuff in the chat. I'm excited to hear what you came up with. Daniela, I'm just going to chime in to say that in our breakout room, the idea of nomenclature and naming came up. So I'm going to just letting everyone know I'm going to put that decadal paper by Matt Descarino in the in the chat. Wonderful. So glad that came up. How's everyone holding up? We are almost done. I'll say what came up in ours, um, what Maggie brought up was this idea of um, meteorites falling perhaps on lands that do not belong to other people and, and how to uh, grapple with the issues of people being, uh, people taking things that they shouldn't be taking and, and really having that conversation. Wonderful, right on. Yeah, if it falls from the sky. <laughs> Does anyone have ownership of anything ever, really? What do we do with that? That's beautiful. I'm so glad. I had would never have thought of that. Right on. Any other thoughts or ideas that came up? We'd love to hear. Again, please, please use the chat if you'd like. Pamela, please. Yeah, just uh, thank you. I feel like I have more tools to use when, you know, when, you know, when staff comes running over to me and say, you know, you need to get a hold of, you know, this tribe and write a proposal because the proposal due, you know, in two months. And, and I have always said, you know, kind of what you did in your scenarios. Who do you know? Do they need this? Do they want this? And and kind of you know to to push back and but given your slides and you know that your scenario you know the scenarios, I really feel like I have better tools to uh, encourage. Well, here's the first steps, and then you know maybe next year. You know, once we have a really good relationship, we can propose. But um, so I feel I feel better equipped to handle those, you know, those people rushing into my office. Thank you. Awesome. Thanks, Pamela. Yes, it can be overwhelming. Great question, Rachel. Genevieve shares the question. Um, Kat, did you want to address that? I do have some thoughts. Uh, Sorry, I, I was answering a different one. Go, go ahead and I'll read it. Read it. Okay. Um, is it better to work on a national level or work with local tribal groups? You know, it's hard to say. There are a lot of ways to connect um, on different levels. Uh, on a national level, there's probably the National Congress of American Indians and CAI, which is seated in DC and, and has many, 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 but not all. Um, nations, tribes, bands, rancheries, and communities as members. Um, there are also regional uh, groups that, you know, sort of Congress together, if you will. Um, one that comes to mind is Affiliated Tribes of Northwest Indians, ATNI. There are also much smaller organizations that actually um, governmentally counsel together, like um, some of the pueblos in northern New Mexico. So I don't know if there's any one that's better than the other, but. Um, you know, that's, it's a good question to think about. And if you have something in mind and you want to really talk through deeply a scenario, reach out to me and Kat and we'll, we can do our best to help support you. Okay. And uh, with that, I think we note it is in fact two o'clock. Okay. We have a last slide to share with you that we hope will be inspirational and otherwise fabulous but it's our way of saying thank you and farewell. 
Oh, let me go full screen, sorry. Okay. So here's our, we did our final sharings. Thank you for those. So just a final thought here. Um, again, we, to, we looked at this image, we felt and thought through a lot here. And, and it doesn't have to stop here as hopefully you have seen and felt and heard and, and integrated throughout these two hours we've, we've gathered. And just visually to, to think through that, there's another image that we can connect with. And um, it, its official name is Reversing Manifest Destiny. It was created a number of years ago by Charles Hilliard, who's a native man. It was commissioned. I'm gonna put a link in the chat where you can learn more and order a copy for yourself if you're interested. But this doesn't have to be the end. This is the beginning, getting informed, you know, taking stock of your feelings, thinking and, and feeling through yourself and your position with respect to the work and moving forward, building relationships. It's just the beginning. So we really want you to feel encouraged. We're here to support you. And, um, and with that, let me turn it over to you, Kat, for final thoughts and words. Yes, um, I just wanna uh, say a, a final yakoki. Thank you um, to all of you for being here. It's very meaningful that you chose to, came, to come to this today to listen to us and to work with us and to um, have the fruits, like I mentioned before, the fruits of all of this coming up in you. So um, very much appreciate you and your time. And I will take an opportunity to close us out. So I too want to thank everyone for taking time to join us um, in our little community of practice event. Hopefully some SMEs and some SIAC teams have had an opportunity to meet and chat and maybe organically grow together. Um, I am dropping a survey over here in the chat. Please do take an opportunity to complete that for us. Additionally, I believe Daniela, you have a personal invitation for people to join the group you'd like to share. Yes, um, we can put this in the chat as well. There's a working group within NASA Science Mission Director at SIAC Community. Um, we very simply call it the American Indian Alaska Native Working Group, and I've been leading that for over six years. We meet ad hoc and have visits from amazing Native scholars talking about their work at the intersection of Westernized and Native science and education. So if you're interested in that, I'll put a couple of things in the chat. We have an archive of all the webinars over all the years and my personal email so you can get with me if you'd like to join that group. I'm already on it. It's there. Oh. Thank you. Taken care of. Um, also, all of the information that has been shared here in the chat, I've tried to do my due diligence of adding all of those links into the Jamboard. So that Jamboard is open to you as continued reference moving forward. Uh, so please go there and access what you can. Otherwise, you will receive a follow up email again with everything included. Um, but thank you all for taking time and making space. Um, to hear from Kat and Daniela. Hope you all have a fantastic day. Thank you all. Thank you, Jessica. Thank you. Thank you, Sina.